Thank you very much for the invitation to come and speak to you today. It's a great honour. I have set a very sort of... There's a lot of slides here. I don't know if I'll get through all the slides, but let's see how we go. I can pick it up in Q&A a little bit later uh, for many questions that you may have. If you're hearing a Northern Irish accent here, if this may be a little stranger to the you than normal, uh, so if I go too quickly at any point, just slow me down. I don't mind being slowed down at all. Uh, it's wonderful to see you all here today as well, so I'm going to try and give you, I'm not talking about competition policy this afternoon, you'll be glad to know. Um, I'm going to try and talk about the idea of where the UK is post-Brexit. The UK has left the European Union, that we know, did so in January 2020. Question is, and this is sort of goes through this presentation, what is the new relationship that the, e, the UK sorry, has with the European Union? How is it shaping? We are now in a much better position to do it today, in 2023, because we're beginning to see UK legislation appear in, in the statute books. That's both UK legislation, UK-wide, and also legislation in both, in both Wales and Scotland. There is no uh, devolution at the moment in Northern Ireland, but we may come back to that old problem again. But what I want to do is I'm going to test, I'm going to tease you in many ways, and test something with you. Because my latest project is looking at the UK, obviously, but this idea of orbiting, and I want to play around with this idea about where the UK actually is as it tries to carve out its new relationship uh, with the European Union and how much has changed. So I'll spend the first part of the presentation looking at that, and the second then very briefly looking at the Northern Ireland problem as it relates to events that happened when the UK left the European Union. And it's very much a live issue, and it's why Northern Ireland currently doesn't have a devolved government. But that may be changing soon. I deliberately chose this picture of a road, a winding road going. We don't know where yet, as the UK begins to traverse all of this. Uh, as I say, I will come and talk about de-Europeanisation um, and this idea of orbiting de-Europeanisation. But the road is just there to give the sense of, it is the UK is on a journey. And I said that Brexit was done in the sense that Brexit has happened. But Brexit is not just one event. What you all have to take away from today, and many of you, all, if not all of you already know, Brexit is a process. That process is nowhere near even when well, it started, but it's in the very early days of it having started. And as the UK works out, back to the idea of where is it with the European Union, it has to deal with a whole series of areas that its agreements as it left the European Union have not dealt with. So there's much more to do. Brexit is a process, and it's that process connected with the idea, with the emergence of new, new, new UK legislation that begins to lead us to, ah, this is the way we might want to look at that relationship with the European Union. Just a few starter points, I'll come back after some of these. The first one I've already said, sometimes though it is worth saying, there is that narrative that the UK was this awkward partner in the European Union. It holds to an extent, it's good for, it's a good question for us to, to give to, to students, but actually the UK found EU membership for the most part really beneficial in a whole host of areas. Yes, there were some it didn't like, but overall, it, it saw membership as, as beneficial, and I'll come back to that in, in a few seconds' time. Also, and I'll come back to this, these are the sort of tastes of what hopefully will be in this presentation uh, towards the end. What was promised in that referendum in 2016, when the UK opted, when the UK public opted to leave the European Union? We had a lot about sovereignty, a lot about taking back control, a lot about not giving any more monies to the European Union and better forms of government at home. So I'll come back to that at the very end. And tied to that is this whole idea of what is radically different about the UK post-Brexit than it was when the UK was a member of the European Union. We can look at certain little differences, but are there major differences there? And the bit that I want to tease out is what type of Brexit is this? How do we classify it? How do we conceptualize it for those political scientists in the room? 
And again, the final bit on green there is the assessment. We're still stock taking. We don't have the final analysis. The UK is still, or the UK departments, uh, ministries, are still going through the EU legislation. I'll come back to that a little bit later. Uh, things they've got to solve almost immediately. Fisheries, car batteries, climate, that list goes on and on and on. So that just it reinforces the idea. Brexit is not one event. It is a process and it has to be worked out. How can it be? That we'll try, I'll try and touch on some of those. It might be useful, I love maps, so it might be useful looking at this map. And again, you will see all the countries in blue are the European Union. You will know the EU is now on a trajectory of enlarging again those countries in green. Maybe not all those countries in green. Uh, but it is planning to be up to 30 states by, sorry, 35 states by 2030. We'll see if that's possible or not. Uh, you the red ones are there. But if you look at the grey, there's a the good old United Kingdom. There's also Switzerland and Norway, uh, but they differ in the sense that, and tidal Liechtenstein, in the sense that they are on arrangements that are closer to the European Union than the UK. So the question I throw out now to you all of you, which we can maybe answer in, in the Q&A is, so where is the UK looking for its new relations when it looks across Europe? Uh, looking at this, you can think of it's trying to move away. Do you conceptualise, should we conceptualise, leaving the UK as de-Europeanisation? I want to come back to that too, because I want to challenge that. But if you just look at that map in terms of those other countries that are great in Europe, Switzerland, Norway and Liechtenstein, again, they are in relationships by the members of the European Economic Area, or their own series of bilateral deals in terms of Switzerland. But the UK doesn't want any of those. UK said quite clearly, they're not the arrangements we want. It then raised the question, well, they're not the arrangements you want. What sort of arrangement do you actually want? And that's what I'll take you into this idea of, of orbiting your organisation in a few moments' time. So, so now the opening remarks. So we said the first one, Brexit, not an event, an ongoing process. The delivery of all of this, what was promised, what was actually, uh, what has so far appeared. Um, we may come back to, I'm not going to touch, I'll touch on them now, we may come back to the Q&A, is the terms of the UK's withdrawal from the European Union, onto the green icon there, the terms of withdrawal agreement, and a very thin trade and cooperation agreement that really was thin. And we may then come back in Northern to look at something called the Windsor Framework. Um, it is in the blue, so trying to, for the, I think the easiest way when I try to describe where I'm going here, it is if you try and identify what is Brexit all about? What was it all about? The aim essentially, the aim was for the UK to leave the European Union. Okay, let's rethink that. I'll read out the words we might want to use for that. It was about the UK trying, clearly determined to leave the EU's orbit, to escape EU influence, to escape the European Court of Justice rulings. It was trying to set itself a new orbit. Part of the discussion in terms of the referendum was about global Britain, global as a work, UK as, as an actor on the world stage, be this on trade. And one of the things the UK is trying to do at the moment is trying to forge those new trade deals. Some of us got, we may question, how significant they are to date. The final thing to note in this sort of very opening remarks is, you may have noticed, this is a huge relief to many of us in the UK, the UK government agreed, took a while, but they finally agreed, the UK rejoins the horizon, that's the EU research scheme, as of January 2024, so UK universities can be in uh, the competition with their European partners. The only thing I note about that is, were we supposed to leave the European Union? Were we supposed to give, not give money to the European Union? You'll find is the UK, by joining this, universities clapping up and down across the UK. But this comes at a cost, financial cost. Is that Brexit? Or well, that maybe a little later. Right. This map, just very, very quickly, the two maps basically showing the same thing. The first one on closest to me is just to highlight the fact in that Brexit referendum two of the UK's four constituent parts did not vote for Brexit. That is blue in Scotland and blue in Northern Ireland. 
The only difference with the map on the right-hand side of that screen is that you'll see in Northern Ireland certain parts of it voted to actually leave the European Union, but they were the minority. Uh, most uh, voted to actually remain. Those yellows you see across England and Wales, you probably already know this, but if you begin to pinpoint where are the UK universities based, and there's a good correlation between many of those yellow areas, if you take down here we've got Plymouth, just above it, we've got Exeter, the big yellow bit just above there is Bath and Bristol, and you can do that across the UK. So, whereas students wear, uh, they tend to be voting for Remain. But anyway, I just show you that to highlight the situation, particularly with Northern Ireland, that we will come back to. So, it's a divided vote. I haven't much really, well, I do actually, I've spent quite a lot talking about each, each of these four individuals. Uh, you may want to go back and ask me in the QA. But all I will say is, I, yeah, there's so many things to say. This one, this one, where to begin? Yeah, where, where indeed to begin with him? Um, there is, for me, and for many other scholars looking at this, the reason the UK voted, what was the, the, the difference? Who made the difference? And there's general analysis, it's not uh, supported by everyone, but mostly he made the difference. He somehow connected with the public in a way that many other politicians didn't do. High poll ratings, they liked him. Um, I think the starting point is, when you look at all of this, is that Brexit was never supposed to happen. The UK government didn't want Brexit. The four main parties in the UK Parliament didn't want Brexit. So somehow, I was assumed that the UK public would vote to remain, narrowly, in the European Union. That vote was a huge shock. No planning had been done for what Brexit would look like. In the civil service, they were told not to do it, so they hadn't done it. Um, many of the groups that actually supported Brexit he being one of them. He was a last minute, again, we can look at his history, but he was a last minute convert to the Brexit cause. And many people say it wasn't about the national interest for him, it was about his own personal interest and how did he become Prime Minister. But there's so much you can say about this now, so much that is being said, but the idea, I mean, putting out today is, he essentially was a guy, leading figure and maybe pushing that campaign for leave. But you know, these people disappeared the day after the vote. They never had spelt out what Brexit would actually look like, how it would operate, and that was then left to be determined by the pick person in the left-hand screen, former Prime Minister Theresa May. She tried. She definitely tried. Uh, she'd been a remainder herself, but circumstances overcame her within her own party. Two other leaders, two former Prime Ministers, Liz Truss lasted all of 49 days, and the current one, Rishi Sunak, who's worth watching. We may come back to him in terms of all of this a little later. If, for those of you who really engage with British politics, I'm going to recommend two books for you now. They've come out in the last six to seven weeks, and they're both excellent, otherwise I wouldn't recommend them. This is one by a journalist looking at the implosion of the Conservative Party. You know, there used to be an old, it wasn't a joke, we were teaching comparative politics in the UK. It used to be, once upon a time, you, you describe the UK system as a very stable political system, as compared to others. And quite often the others happened to be Italy. And Italy, again, the old joke was that, you know, we're not like Italy. Italy's had how many governments since the end of the Second World War? Are we, are we, are we still in uh, two digits? Are we into three digits by now? That old joke has gone because in the space of five years, the UK has had more governments than Italy ever had. So uh, we won't hear that one again. But this is very good laying out what was happening in the party. And this one gives you, which again, former... MP, junior minister, gives his experience of what life was like in the party at that time, and he eventually resigned, saying, I can't take it anymore. Basically, these people don't quite know what they are doing. But enough of that, we may come back to it. 
Just in terms of the timeline, if we think about de-Europeanization, where does it begin? Formally, it probably begins the moment that Article 50 is triggered by the UK. There's another irony here, of course, is that one of the actual architects um, of Article 50, Lord Clare, uh, former very senior UK diplomat, he never expected when he was drafting it the country that would actually use it would be the UK, but that we'll leave that for now. I will come back to Northern Ireland, um, and what I will say here is that during the referendum, the Northern Ireland issue was never really looked at. It appeared sporadically in the press. Uh, this was going to have a much lasting influence in terms of the subsequent negotiations and how the UK suddenly realised they had made well, it's something they had to solve. Let's leave it at that for now and I'll come back to it. And I will also come back to this lovely sounding retained EU law act. But more, but it's important in the story that we're going to tell about this de-Europeanisation. And is it de-Europeanisation? I'm not the, the very sharp uh, eye of you will notice this table isn't quite correct, particularly for example if you look at the Eurozone, so you have a few those cut flags further up, ignore that bit. It's, what, it's the bit I want to show you, look where the UK actually is, in the left hand side of the screen at the top. Where is the UK? What relationships is she in with other European states? Does it matter? Uh, we can discuss that. But where is it with, in terms of the European Union? And on that note, again, if you look at 2017, who were the major trading partners of the UK? And I'm not reading down the list, but you can see who they were. And rather important. Um, on the right-hand side, these new trade deals that are being agreed. The big one they want is the United States. I'll tell you maybe uh, why that's not happening at the moment. Uh, but the UK is trying to get trade deals but they are substantially, significantly, way, way weaker than what they had as a member of the European Union. Now park that, because it will come into our discussions as we go forward. Just to say in terms of where the UK, it's those countries coloured orange, from where I'm standing, uh, maybe red from where you are sitting, that the UK has now trade deals with. Um, yeah, economics 101, you trade with your closest partners, maybe. Anyway, it's trading in New Zealand are actually there with Japan. Um, more work is going to try and actually create more trade deals, but still haven't actually occurred. We can pass on that. I want to come now to the actual type of European integration literature, and particularly conceptualization. De Europeanization. We're seeing a lot of de Europeanization. Mostly with regards foreign defence policy, mostly with regards Turkey. Does it really apply in the UK's case? I want to question that because I'm not sure that it does. Could we talk about partial de Europeanisation? Maybe, but not happy with that either. Differential integration now is much more attractive. It takes us back to that uh, diagram you saw a few moments ago with the UK on that left hand side in that purple zone. It also takes you back to Jacques Delors, talked about in the 1990s, the idea of uh, concentric circles within the European Union. Possible, possible for that one. Disintegration, there is disintegration studies, is that what's happening? There is a body of work looking at the UK talking about disengagement and then re-engagement, particularly with regard to environmental policy. We may come back to that. And looking at all of these, I'm trying to think, so do these apply to what's happening with the UK? And I'm going to show you something now that I think that makes me think, I'm not sure about it is, we need something else to conceptualise what the EU is. And that's why I'm going to introduce you this afternoon, this idea of orbiting Europeanisation. And the basic premise of this is that the UK has still not escaped the EU's orbit. Uh, what do you think of it as a rocket trying to blast off? Uh, now, this may vary from policy area to policy area, but something I'm going to show you, um, and this, I should say is my current work on a project looking at a series of policy areas, um, and the conclusion in terms of the two we've done to date of competition, particularly state aid and environmental policy, the UK does not look to have escaped the EU's gravitational pull. The idea is the EU has so much gravitational mass that actually it impacts on those states around it. So, back to the UK. 
In pursuing Brexit, those who pursued it hadn't worked out what it would look like, how it would then shape, with the UK being the single market, European economic area, customs union, never really spelt out. So that was left to the governments afterward to try and work out what was happening. But what they did is they created policy traps for themselves along the way. Some of them, Northern Ireland is probably the biggest one, depending on how you see uh, Northern Ireland against other policy areas. But it also impacted on other policy areas. So you also get the emergence of what we're calling placebo policies. They look, I mean, one example I'm going to give you is, I will refer just on this one uh, occasion to state aid. There is a new UK state aid policy on the books. It came into force at the very beginning of this academic year, at the very beginning, take that back, very beginning of this calendar year. And it looks like, it looks like a new UK law, but back to linguistics in terms of playing with words. If you look at this new uh, piece of UK law, the word state aid, that's the EU and the EU pilots, words, two words, state aid, you won't find them anywhere. Gone. Removed from the text. Um, the UK Act will talk about subsidies and subsidy control. If you look again in UK parliament, they talk about undertakings a lot, particularly in the legal uh, sphere. That's been struck off as well, and with the, the uh, legislation as well. And they talk about businesses, their enterprises. Okay, what are they trying to say here? If you look at that UK law, it looks very familiar to something else. In terms of the way it's been conceived, in terms of the concepts, uh, and obviously looks very much like EU state aid law. But they've changed the terminology so it's sold as different. Uh, yes, there are some different things in it, but they are tiny on the periphery of things in terms of the thresholds when state aid is applied. Uh, and you conceptualize, conceptualization of how state aid, different types of state aid could be favored. But on the whole, it's the EU policy with add-ons. That's not the way it's sold. Um, so do we have here a placebo policy? It looks like a new UK law. Like it is a new UK law on the statute books. But actually, it's not too different from the EU level, which then takes you back to this idea of placebo policies. And you begin to find it in other areas as well. This leads us to really difficult questions for Brexiteers, because they have got to deliver on what um, uh, Brexit has actually achieved. And I will come back to this at the very end. So should we expect to see more alignment with EU laws? That's not Brexit, but is that what's happening? And um, the one to look out for in many ways is that Labour Party. It looks like things change. It looks like the Labour Party will come to power at the end. Pro election probably takes place October next year, um, in 2024. And they're already talking about closer alignment. It's not Brexit. And I didn't say I'd mention this lovely sounding EU retained law. All I, the aim here is was really quite simple from the Brexiteers. You take every bit of EU law that's on the UK statute books and you just strike them all down, every single one of them. That is insane. Yeah? Because you've got to go back and look at each of those laws. And now, so you've a choice, you either remove them, you tweak them, or you keep them as they are. And part of the problem is here is capacity. The UK civil service doesn't have a lot of the capacity to deal with a lot of these things. So this idea of a new law, new act, came into force in the late summer. You can take away many of these actual sort of laws, but will they? That's the issue. Um, there are different. This takes us into looking at the UK and the intra-UK, Scotland, Wales, and Northern Ireland, and how they're all approaching Brexit. You're going to see lots of clashes here between the regimes and how they then begin to line up with uh, EU policy and wider UK policy. So that we will see in the next couple of years. I'm not going through this awful-looking slide with all these hypotheses actually on it, but basically what it says. Let's try to work out 
is in theory the UK has the power to create its own new laws and will do so, but at the end of the day it's going to remain in many of those areas in close regulatory alignment with existing EU policies. Is that Brexit? I don't think so. And hypothesis two is are they using existing EU policies as a starting point for new UK policies? That's the placebo element coming into all of this. So what I'm saying basically is the current conceptualization of what is happening, de-Europeanization, partial uh, Europeanization, differential integration, I don't think they apply. And I don't think the differentiated integration one applies as well because unlike Norway and all, all like uh, Switzerland, they are trying to, they have their arrangements close relations. The UK said it doesn't want that, therefore it's trying to get out. But it can't get out, it can't escape the UK, the EU's actual pool in all of this. But, yeah, we don't even really complain about it, shifting orbits, but you know, and we can have some fun about, you know, new celestial equal, the, the, the Brexit here is saying the UK will be the sun, um, there's a moon, there is a junk orbit, we laugh about this in terms of, you know, uh, our friends in the science do talk about junk orbits, orbits where satellites, rockets are sent to, to rest, or does the UK get lost in space? That's just flippant comments for me in, term, in terms of where the UK is going. The real question is where is the UK actually going and escaping? Can it escape the European Union? I just, it's about velocity, what well, the velocity it needs is these new trade deals. It has to get those trade deals as the first part in all of this. Put that in context, let's move on very quickly to Northern Ireland. Yeah, this is one part of the Brexit puzzle that didn't quite work in the way that they thought it would. Partly because people didn't sit and think in government, that is, think about what is the significance of the UK leaving the European Union for Northern Ireland. And the significance is, is Northern Ireland is the only part of the UK that shares a land border with the Republic of Ireland. And again, it comes from a time of conflict. That border was removed as part of the single European market in the early 1990s. Um, and there were questions about, what did the UK leave? Does that border become an EU border? Yes. What is the nature of that border? Do you begin to see checks on that Irish border? This is where it became politically very difficult and it divided the major political parties in Northern Ireland because what they wanted to do was prevent a hard border on the island of Ireland. Johnson, back to Johnson again, uh, he had a whiz, he thought we can solve this and the worst reason they just couldn't get an agreement accepted in Parliament, which he did with the EU. He said, I can get my party on board, I will get them to, ex I'll have my own negotiations with the uh, EU, and I'll get a far better deal with the, the EU than Theresa May ever could. Of course he doesn't, you know, there's marginal changes again. But what he does is he creates his Northern Ireland protocol, and for that to operate, Northern Ireland remains in a single market, rules for three, four main principles of the EU, the free movement of goods, services, ca capital, and people, then this idea you've now got a border for goods down the Irish Sea. This sent the unionist polit political parties into, ha into a, hard, a period of where they just would not accept this. And you'll see if you ever look at this, things like this, they talk about the sea border. And the sea border is now down the Irish Sea. For the last four years, this has been the major issue of debate in Northern Ireland about this sea border and this isn't really Brexit. Brexit was something different and they're trying to resolve it. They haven't, of course, but a step forward in terms of the Windsor framework, which just, I'll show you what it tries to do, is this one. If you try, the concern from the EU was simply could you get goods coming from GB into Northern Ireland and those goods would then move into the Republic of uh, Ireland and then into the, in the EU proper and they wanted those controlled. So as of last month in the Northern Ireland case, you now have what are called red lines and green lines as goods move from GB to the Republic. 
law sounds really a bit dry, a bit boring, but actually politically it's huge in terms of how do you get at some of the unions, there should be no border down the IRC, goods should not be checked coming from the GB and Northern Ireland, they're not checked the other way. What this means for firms and businesses is much more paperwork. And you're already beginning to see certain people from GB are no longer shipping things to Northern Ireland because they're just too difficult, too many more forms to fill out. And actually, we don't make that much money, so we're not doing it. So this has been the big issue in terms of good old Northern Ireland and trying to resolve it. That's the party that actually has been the Democratic Unionist Party that has actually been holding things all up, um, refusing to go back. They're the ones that the whole government stopped because they pulled out. It was a consultation agreement as befitting a divided society. Whether that's a good system or not, we could debate that. Um, the protocol has been tweaked, now called this Windsor Framework, but it doesn't, it solves some things, but it doesn't solve that major issue. There is still that sea border actually in play. Um, it doesn't matter, you say. Well, what about this one as an example? A tale of arsenic. Arsenic is used, so in the UK, and tiny amounts to turn cake flour white. So it looks even better, it looks fresher, cleaner, whiter. It's allowed in the UK, it's not allowed in the EU, and you get all these issues about standards. The standards are now slightly lower in the UK than they are in the EU. Does that matter? Not if you're selling in the UK market, but if you're trying to sell in the EU market, then there's issues, and therefore this comes into play in terms of Northern Ireland. Therefore, if we export things at lower standards, do they get into the EU? Therefore, we're not going to allow that. So this is an example of the issues that have actually arisen in terms of how, in terms of trading between GB and Northern Ireland. Uh, you can take your pick, which is the, is, the, is, is the better option? So there's lots of questions here coming into play, and how am I doing time-wise? So, questions we've got to ask about all of this is about transposition, and I think this is, these are tricky questions for Northern Ireland in terms of, and in the UK, who transposes EU laws um, that will fit with, because remember, the Northern Ireland is still in the EU single market, so in the single market for goods. Northern Irish legislation is going to keep on top of this legislation from Brussels, so who's monitoring it? Actually, one step back, who's monitoring it in the UK? Is it a case that existing UK laws, they will keep abreast of EU laws, but if EU laws change, how, do, how does the UK actually keep on top of all of those? So that's what to be, and again, the, the issue here is the capacity of the civil service in both GB and particularly Northern Ireland. And it comes back to a number, we call them sort of Tufton Street uh, people in terms of the literature. These are right-wing think tanks and pro-Brexit groups are at, that advised Liz Truss, former Prime Minister, and Johnson, and they have, um, everything is possible. We can do all these things, and at one point the UK was on the point, actually it was twice on the point of bringing forward legislation that actually would break international law by overriding, what are the technicalities of this, by overriding parts of the protocol. That didn't happen in the end, but it very nearly did, and what might the consequences have been for the UK as a trusted partner, as a tried of trade deals with other parts of the world. So we're near, near the end of all of this in terms of, for those in terms of into the Northern Ireland, the whole aspect of it is how you then move on with an area, part of the UK, um, that actually is trying to bring two communities together and, tra and tra to actually work. And we may come back to all of those. The Windsor Framework doesn't really reset the process. As far as Rishi Sunak's concerned, this is wonderful. He's as happy as can be with the terms of his Windsor Framework. Because for him, the impact, you've got to bear, when you think about Northern Ireland, the thing to bear in mind here is, for the moment, Northern Ireland is a problem. 
why the problem is not openly side for the UK. The UK has still got to pay attention what is happening in Northern Ireland with regard to single market for goods. If Northern Ireland wasn't part of the UK, hey, that would be much simpler, wouldn't it? There have been opinion polls done in the GB about Northern Ireland remaining in the UK. They are overwhelmingly against. We're into the 80s and 90% here. If the UK public had a, a vote in Northern Ireland, they would be rejected. Um, so this comes into play, but uh, so it was EU relations take first priority for the Sudan government over anything with Northern Ireland. Northern Ireland, only two million people. You could also argue at what extent does the EU begin to lose interest? Does it lose interest in Northern Ireland, a region of two million people? Uh, one thing to note about the Brexit negotiations is just how much Northern Ireland was always at the top sort of stage of those discussions. So I don't want to take this down to, into too, uh, too many more technicalities of all of this, but hey, next year's a big year in terms of might get this protocol, we've got a new commission, a new European Parliament, it could be changes in the Council, and then at the end of the year, there could be UK elections. So a lot could change in 2024 about where we're actually going. But past that, I don't want to look at that, that we go back to the Trade and Cooperation Agreement. I do want to come back to this, because this is beginning. The track has done from the very early day, months of 2017, about attitudes towards the European Union. Were you right to vote for, Re uh, for Brexit or wrong? And what you're getting now, too late now, is into the 50s, beginning to say it's still very low, but it's still a reversal of what was there. 55% thinking that it was the wrong decision. 33%, some very hardcore people that think it's absolutely the right decision, and the problem is it's not being uh, done in the way that Brexit should actually have been done. And there are questions too about, you may want to know, but would the UK rejoin the European Union? I'll leave that question for now. And of course, the other big issue in all of this is Northern Ireland. We will come back to that just in a second, but just to show you another publication that has just uh, been published as well from UK and the Changing Europe. And they are talking about regret. And uh, it's this idea, are people beginning to question what has been delivered from Brexit? And the answer is yes, they are. And they are beginning to question, you promised us this, this, and this, but these benefits we haven't seen. This goes into a bigger narrative discussion about trust, faith in politicians and what they might promise and what they can actually deliver. So watch that one. Um, and again, as I said at the beginning, we're beginning to see these. It was too difficult in those very early years to say what was going to happen. We didn't know what was going to happen, what the leave would actually look like. Uh, seven years on now with legislation, we are beginning to see what parts of leave look like. And of course there's this issue that may come into play as well, Irish unification. It's back on the uh, airways, people talking about this. Could it be that Northern Ireland then joins the uh, Irish Republic? How is this done? There is a, I haven't talked about the Good Friday Agreement that ended the conflict in 1998, but happy to take any questions that you may have. But it has within its provisions, there can be a referendum. And some parties are very excited about having a referendum. Other parties are a little less so. Uh, political issues come into play. But it is, Leo Varadka, the Irish Prime Minister said, and he's only 45, uh, said that he could see an, a referendum on Irish unity and Irish unity by the time of his death, whenever that may have to be, but soon. He was tending to live to his 80s or his 90s. Um, but this also comes into to play. And just to show you about Northern Ireland changing as well, it has changed a bit. You will see in terms of the population there has been a shift. And if you look at, you will see the rising number of those born to the Catholic faith. Doesn't mean they're all nationalists. And similarly in terms of those of the Unions community who are mostly Protestant but not actually on. You can see 
the change there. The one to look for is that green uh, line, which those people who are not aligned, they get these data from the census. People are asked, are you Catholic? Are you Protestant? Are you another religion? Are you none? Are you not declaring? And that green group are the ones that are not declaring. But the demographics have changed, which leads people to think, hey, now is the time for Irish unification. Has Brexit made this easier? We could debate that. Brexit has certainly brought the idea of United Ireland more to the mainstream than it would have been had Brexit not actually occurred. And that's back to sensitivities about that uh, inner Irish border. And the final thing to show you is this. Um, or oh, was there one more? No, this is it. Uh, playing around with these uh, earlier on. Brexit remains very much a decisive fact, a divisive factor in British politics. I said earlier there'll be a UK general election next year. The political parties won't talk about Brexit. They're frightened to. Um, it will probably take two more government changes. Let's assume Labour comes into power next year. And then they're defeated five years later and the Conservatives are back. It's only after that point, I think, that Brexit then might do what was Brexit the right decision or the wrong decision. A lot could happen internationally in the European Union, let alone in British politics over that time. You have to remember, as I said at the very beginning, Brexit isn't just one event. It is a process. And now you've got the UK government and those departments of state trying to work out or some of these EU policies, should we keep them? I mean, the idea was to throw them all out, but actually that's not happening. Do we keep them? Do we just tweak them? Um, but that then raises questions about what was Brexit about then? So you're keeping EU policies. Oh yeah, but you can say, but we've taken back control. Because now, Parliament, UK Parliament, or a devolved Parliament, they're making their own decisions. That's sovereignty. And you're thinking, yeah, that's true, but then that's uh, but those decisions you are becoming, I haven't used the word yet, a decision taker rather than maker. You're actually using, taking EU laws, adding a few tweaks, you've got a new UK policy, but how really UK actually is. So for Brexit and the blue poses many questions. For some, it's never been delivered, never truly uh, delivered. The big issue on the orange, though maybe it's less important than it once was, I talked about Northern Ireland, the other big issue here was Scotland. And to one extent did Brexit actually pose issues within Scotland about membership of the European Union. Um, Scotland, you will know, had its 2014 referendum campaign, its vote, it lost 55-45, um, huge relief for London. I think Scottish independence is falling away, support for that, but we'll wait for 2024, but it looks like it's in decline, its high point was in 2014, sorry, 2014, and I said, and I leave you with this, in terms of 2024, in terms of could the UK change, new Labour government, change its stance on the European Union, but it brings back again, and I come back to this idea of orbiting Europeanisation, the UK's out, but actually, it still hasn't escaped in many areas, not saying at all, but in many of them, it still hasn't escaped the gravitational pull of the European Union. And if it hasn't, is it caught? And I also use the word orbiting, because orbiting gives this sense that you can't escape. You're all, you are actually caught. So some people will definitely not like the phrase orbiting, because you haven't had the velocity to escape. But that may be where the UK actually is. How it explains all of this to the public, who explains it, where, where, and how, that's something you'll be watching for at least the next 10 years, and probably longer. But yeah, I think it does me at this stage. There's a lot covered there, so thank you very much, folks. Thank you very much indeed, Lee, for so many hints and food for thought, condense it in such a short time. Uh, I have to say I really enjoyed your presentation because you were focusing on so many issues that are part of a debate that from this side of the channel considered 
uh, the UK and London, but from this part of, of the sea, as far as Ireland is concerned, since you said that the, the sea border is so important. Um, it's very, it's very nice. Um, while you were presenting, I, I was playing with my telephone, not, not because I was playing, I was looking for a clip that later I will show you if you want. I don't remember, if you remember, yes, Minister, the reason why uh, the UK is in Europe. Maybe later we will play this clip. Uh, it's, it's really uh, funny, but unfortunately very true, in a way. Um, I will start with, with a little comment. You pointed out something that, to me, is a real issue. Northern Ireland is about 2 million people. And, of course, you implied maybe not such an interesting market for, for some people. Do you believe that this is, first of all, one of the issues? Since most of the campaign were not just on economic issues, but political ones, like uh, let's take back control, etc. Do you believe that Northern Ireland people would really understand now if there is a real, uh, let's say, British interest in Northern Ireland in political terms, or just as they are a possible, not so attractive market? Because for sure, if the political uh, side would would prevail, probably someone would decide to rejoin or join Ireland, Republic of Ireland, because then it's a political issue. If it's the market, then, then London has to show that you are not just at the periphery of the kingdom, but you are part of what is a united kingdom. Just to start with, and then we will hear questions from the student. And this is just one of of the elements that's <laughs> where to begin. Um, okay. There's again for those of you as on that diagram there, Northern Ireland is, is is split between two main communities, one looking towards the United Kingdom and one looking towards the Irish government in terms of Irish unification. Um, the days of conflict are over, it's just trying to deal in terms of the politics of all of this. One of the strange things in terms of the unionist Protestant, and I, they're not quite the same, but just in, in, for now, for the unionist Protestant sort of community is, they are well aware that the UK government, that the UK public don't actually really want them. Uh, this comes through time and time again in Vox Pops and radio phone-ins. Uh, you'll hear the average person say, but they, they know the UK doesn't want them. But for them, Brexit was a case for them to show that they were actually really British and try and make a case that they really, really, really were British by saying that if the UK leaves the European Union, then we can get back closer, can we try and pull together closer to the UK and the UK, uh, UK people in general, but also UK government. But as I said, the UK public, again, would not support this idea in terms of no, again, many, again, great generalisation coming into play here, but many people in terms of the UK, we are GB, we use Great Britain in the sea, in terms of people in Ireland, Northern Ireland, they're all Irish, so they, they don't see the contrast, they just remember the days of conflict, and they say it could all be resolved better if, if they maybe weren't uh, within the uh, Republic. That, those, just to say, and I'll pass it, but those conversations are beginning. They're going to take a long time. It's not the West German, East German model. It's not a case of the, uh, the Republic of Ireland absorbing uh, Northern Ireland, as in the West German, East German uh, model way back in 1990. There's lots of discussions to be had about what does the future of the Irish state look like politically, constitutionally? Is, there a, is it going to be a devolved settlement for Northern Ireland? Is it going to be a federal system for the entire Republic of Ireland? I don't think so. But these are discussions that are now beginning. So how would it change? What would the flag be? What would the anthem be? The anthem, anthem is a little problematic. Um, what would the anthem be? How do you deal with this two, maybe one million in the north part of Ireland who actually were looking to feeling they were British rather than Irish? So lots of issues have yet to be uh, discussed. When people tell you about a border poll referendum on Irish unity, it is coming. 
It's closer than it has been at any time since Northern Ireland was founded. But it's not coming next month, it's not coming next year, it's probably at least 10 years away and probably longer until that, because those real discussions when you divide societies have got to be done. And the big tricky question I threw out related to Brexit here for you to think about, in referenda, what is a winning majority? Is it 50% plus one? Is that, a, and I, this is what I throw to all of you that, for states that hold referenda, are you happy with 50% plus one, or do you have some form of supermajority? What is the supermajority? Is it 60%? Is it two thirds? Is it 66%? What actually, because part of the whole thing with Brexit is, the, re, the result was too close. And yet, a really close result, just over a, 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 a 4%, less than four percentage points, just over a million people, you have quite a tight result, but you go for a really hard form of Brexit. That was a series of mis political miscalculations. So yes, there's a lot. But I'm, I'll keep quiet at this point. Thank you so much. Yes, you're right. What is a suitable majority? Uh, you know, uh, and especially because in, in the last 20 years, as we know, most of the very deciding uh, political choices have been with a 51%. And this is why spin doctors and political aid are looking to shift this little 5-4% of swing waters or big conceptual, as they are called, to lean towards a part instead of another. But I agree with you, this is not really... And I was thinking while you were saying the anthem, the flag, etc. And maybe the formula, uh, two nations, one country. But, <laughs> but then you're back again to the problem of the United Kingdom that is not united so much anymore. Or I was thinking about what the Scottish were said, the late uh, Nicola Sturge when she was saying uh, Scotland, Ireland, etc. should look for a political way to rejoin the European Union. But thinking about a possible uh, union between them is far away, I think, and you're right. At the moment we are too much into the problem. It's very difficult to have a kind of detached uh, observation. And just to say, in terms of Nicola Sturgeon, a former leader of the uh, Scottish Government who had resigned earlier this year, financial irregularities uh, pushed her out, but she talked about if there were, and she had wanted a new Scottish referendum next year, she had talked about if she w were to win it, she would then call for Scotland to join, rejoin the European Union. That, again, is, is, is possible if she'd left the UK. Um, I guess what she never did was really try and explain, and this is one of the things that, and you'll think about your own states that are currently members of the European Union or those that may be thinking of joining the European Union. The biggest issue with the European Union has always been how do you explain the EU to people who aren't students like yourselves actually studying it? The EU's not perfect, there are problems. Uh, the political system is perfect. But in terms of the UK, in terms of both, it, 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 it came to head in the referendum, and no one had really sat down to explain what the EU was all about. Why we had it, uh, what it did, what benefits it provided, and if you don't do that, at some point there comes an issue, you want the backing of, of the public, it's a little difficult. Just one more question, because you generate uh, really uh, a train of thought. Do you believe that it could be really possible, given if one of the scenarios is that the UK would like to rejoin again the European Union? Do you think that the European Union would be available to renegotiate and rediscuss everything after the British upper stiff lip approach they had in the negotiation for the Brexit? Because, of course, you know, they were talking about the divorce, but it, it was not that consensual, although, <laughs> although we came to a solution in the very end. It was, yeah. A large part of that was you could go back, and I had them on the other slides that I removed that you'll be glad to know about, could things have been different with a different political leaders? And I think the answer to that is yes. The EU, from their perspective, had, had, the trust had gone with particularly the Johnson government. There was no trust there. Uh, they looked at things like these two bills to um, 
break international agreement, which the, uh, they signed up in terms of the protocol. Um, no trust, that was definitely, I forgot what I was going to say, this, that, that's the other part, but yeah, that was certainly something that needs to be there. I mean, I remember, <laughs> comes back to me, it seemed too old. Um, would the UK, having spent four years in the negotiations, UK, EU, would be ready for another round of, hey, let's join again, we, you know, we, it's time for us to be back. Yeah, they could. Probably would. I mean, the UK, yes, is missed. And states, you know, you talk to individuals from states working whether in the Commission or the Council, whatever part, or even the Parliament, and uh, they'll be less receptive than the Parliament. They say they miss the UK for a variety of reasons, in terms, even other member states sorely miss the UK as the one that might object to, to, to certain areas. The, da the problem for the UK is going to be if, if it ever were to make that case. It's not coming in, I'm presuming, under the terms when it left. So remember, it wasn't in a single currency. It's not going to get that opt out again. It'll be, if you're going to come in again, you're coming in for the, the full thing. So a full package. So I suspect ideas of the UK rejoin the European Union, they're at least a generation, at least 10 years away, but probably a generation away, if ever. Thank you so much. Questions from the audience? <coughs> oh, yes, please. There's one there. Okay. Uh, my, yes, it's first. my name is Julia. Thank you so much for the interesting lecture. Um, I have a question concerning the domestic issues, especially in light of the poverty rates and the high cost of living. Uh, to what extent do you see Brexit as uh, contributing to the worsening of the inaccessibility of poverty? Thank you. I'll stand rather than hide behind that, uh, that screen. Uh, it's, it's, it's an issue, if I take it one step further back, part of the people, one of the surprising things about Brexit on the night of the uh, result, it was assumed the yes camp had actually won, narrowly. And David Cameron sat, and he were there. they had opened the bottle of champagne. Uh, they thought that the first results, and even the, those of the uh, the, Brex, the Brexiteers, thought they had lost, and were constructing a sort of how do we actually set, how do we explain this in the following morning? Now you think how does this relate to the question? Because when the results began to come in, and began to come in the northeast of England, so where the highest poverty rates actually are. And it became clear that many of those traditional labour-held seats with uh, lower educational standards, with higher unemployment, poverty were all issues. It became clear they were voting for Brexit. And for many of them, it was actually voting for... I mean, again, lots of discussions and analysis have gone on since then. And if you imagine from their perspective, do we actually voting for the status quo? So remaining in the European Union, or are, are things going to improve for us in terms of our, our jobs, whatever? And uh, so they took, they had nothing to lose, therefore they voted to actually leave. Those issues haven't gone away. And when you see the 2019 general election, you see this huge surge, actually it's not that huge surge for themselves, it just looks like it, when they, many of these seats, former Labour held seats, switched to the Conservative uh, Party. Again, these people in these seats are now. It's the same questions they have. They're looking around their town centres. Uh, many of the shops have long gone. They're out of town centres. They're looking at unemployment. There are still issues. Uh, so those issues for them haven't gone away. And for many of them, Brexit hasn't yet delivered. But I think they're still puzzled about why it hasn't delivered and who's to blame for all of this. But yeah, so those issues are still, still very much there in the modern UK. And I think we've had the highest number of bankruptcies of small firms this week in the UK at any point since 2009. So there are serious issues in the UK sort of structure of, of, of economic activity, both the employer side and the employee side. Other questions? Yes, please. Over there. Hello. Um, so, given the recent history in Northern Ireland and uh, the fact that, as you mentioned, the conversation about Irish unification is 
gaining support. Uh, do you think that it is actually a realistic prospect of seeing you know, the island of Ireland become one state? And second of all, what's the situation with you know, the, the violence coming back to the island and the return to the day of the troubles? So the first one, yeah, I can see it happening. Uh, but don't ask me when, <laughs> That's, but I'm not going to uh, predict the thing. Um, predictions of the past haven't worked. Um, I can see it happening. It's being engaged in more than it has been. Violence, you know, this was used by, when the negotiation in the UK and the EU were being, were being done, this issue of, there was a lot of criticism. Neil Varadkar, who was then, who was then also for he stepped down, now he's back, uh, when he was former Prime Minister, took uh, to the Council, of, of, of the European Council, images of violence and said, this is the way it was, do you want to go back to all that? That sort of um, wasn't well received in, uh, in, 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 in Northern Ireland, in certain political parties. Is violence going to come back? I don't think so. There, but that said, there are still very small, they are very small groups of people who still engage in violence. It's very low key. Anyway, yeah, it's very low key. Yes, unfortunately, sometimes there are fatalities. Um, but they won't disappear. I mean, even if Ireland is gone tomorrow, is it unified tomorrow, they're not going to disappear. And uh, they're still going to be there making it gives them, it gives them some sense of, you know, of, of, who, they, of who they are. Um, not very much, but it, from their perspective, it is. So violence, in that sense, is going to return. The only way I could see violence really return, and this is what links back to this previous question, You've got to persuade, and it's not the million Protestant Unionists, because I'm not happy with, with that definition, but a, there's a percentage of them, a smaller percentage, you've got to persuade them, because this would have come as a complete uh, shock. Um, they don't want unification at all under any circumstances, so could, might they engage in violence? But, and they, talk, they do talk about this. But if they do, and you run through, okay, what happens next? So you engage in violence, you could have very little support. You won't support the UK government, the Irish government, the EU, the United States, big player in all of this, in all that, will be horrified. And you, and you, you, you wage violence, what happens, or where do you go? You've only got to make a choice. You either stay in this new state, or you leave to go to GB. And I think part of the fear of some of them is they probably, again, these are more back to these are, yeah, talk, we don't try to talk about economic classes the way we used to do in the past, but these are traditional working class, loyalist areas, low uh, issues with unemployment, educational attainment, who for their life it's about. Um, that identity with the UK, and if that goes, that questions their sort of worldview, but they'll probably also know if they go to GB, they're probably not going to be welcomed in many areas. It's real, strange thing. And if you, any of you ever go to Belfast, I'm sure some of you have actually been, and you go on the tours, the, the tours that are very popular are those political, historical tours. Um, and you will go into some of those other communities. Hey, you'll be impressed by the murals, a lot of those are changing these days, they're very much more peaceful looking uh, than the ones in the past. But in terms of you go into the loyalist heartlands, and this always surprises my English friends when they come over and we do the usual tour, or I put them in the bus and let them do the tour, uh, is the number of British flags they see everywhere. If we don't have this in, in GB, we fly the flag obviously, but not the way the flags are being, being, being flown here. So, it's back to this idea of where we began about you've an area coming out of conflict, you have two communities, what you've got to do is build the bridges between those two communities. You're never going to take everyone with you. There are always going to be elements who may threaten violence, engage in violence, but they are the minority, but sometimes that minority can be problematic. chance to visit Belfast uh, a month ago actually and I was in <laughs> hope you enjoy it <laughs> much, I enjoyed it very much and I had a, a chance to have a meeting at uh, Solmont in the parliament and I had a meeting with um, 
Irish secretary at the uh, Northern Ireland office, and I asked them about the um, possibility of the referendum um, because the climate has drastically changed. And as I experience, a lot of people are more likely to vote um, to uh, for the separation from the UK, and they were very <laughs> reluctant <laughs> to give me an answer, of course. Um, but um, my question was, uh, what is your um, opinion and view um, on the DUP's move of boycotting the formation of the parliament and the um, whole um, stance about the protocol? Because in, in my opinion, it undermines the whole idea of the Good Friday Agreement, right? And also um, it creates uh, it just gives um, um, it. How to say? Esca it uh, escalates the climate that is anti uh, anti UK. Let's say. Yeah, the Northern Ireland office. I'm going to give you. Once you begin to talk about unification or polls, they'll step away very quickly. They they, they politically can't say anything. Um, uh, uh, I mean, in the Good Friday Agreement, there is that provision you hold a referendum. But once you hold the first one, there's also provision that you hold them on every seven years. So once they start the process, and you can just, I mean, you can work out yourselves if you're designing an agreement, is that a good way to approach it or a, or a bad way? And also the fact they never resolved was this majority about what, at the moment, is a simple majority. That's led to headlines in the last week between the UK minister saying, no, it has to be a super majority. And the Irish chief, and they came right back to Leo Varadkar, the Irish Prime Minister, saying, no, 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 50 plus one, 57 plus one is actually fine. So that, that is uh, still, still, still very divisive in, in how, and how you approach all that. And the second point was the... Uh, the question about the, the UK and their... Um, the Northern Ireland Office, the Northern Ireland Office, and what they are doing to escalate feelings yeah. of against the UK and Loyalist Party. Yeah. We talked about, I talked about policy traps earlier. The DUP, this Democratic Unionist Party, the largest party representing the unionist community, they also made a trap. They also fell into a trap. They played the trap for Brexit. Ha yeah, they were never really interested in the European Union. The European Union didn't really sort of feature in any of their discussions, uh, party annual uh, programs. They just didn't think about the EU, and for them, leaving the EU was really, they'd always been Eurosceptic, but never really played, even, they never really talked about it. For them, Brexit was the opportunity to connect closer to, 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 to the uh, uh, UK. They were told at the time, but they dismissed many of us. Um, we said, you've got to be very careful what you do here, because if it goes the other way, and the UK leaves the European Union, then you will have... Um, an issue whereby they'll have to draw a border somewhere. Now we initially thought it was going to be, very few people thought about the border down the Irish Sea in 2016. They did think about that north-south point. That's what it's going to have to be. So the resolution of that, and I'm going to show you this map but again. Very, that one. Yeah, that map one. If you look at this map here, look at Northern Ireland and those areas colored blue, there are the contingencies that are held by most by the Democratic, in fact they're all held by the Democratic Unionist Party at this current uh, state of time. If you look, none of those are on the border. So for many of those people who are there, they don't, uh, sorry, how many of them are crisscrossing the border? Do they think about the border? No, it's not. So they can never understand, UK has left the European Union, why isn't the border between Northern Ireland and Southern Ireland? It makes sense. We've left, da -da, there's the border. I think, yes. True, but you've got to then think of the wider Good Friday Agreement uh, provision of the people, um, and that's just not going to work. And it's a trap that they fell into, thinking that would work. They should have known better uh, that that would work. They get the border down the Irish Sea, and there really is no resolution to that one. The question I put, I don't know, the comment I make on that is, I think for most people don't really care about the border down the Irish Sea, uh, but a certain group of them, uh, part politicals, certainly do, but I think most people are just prepared to, yeah, it doesn't affect us, we're not companies, we're not filling in the paperwork, we're okay.
while we wait, oh yes, um, just a comment. I, I perfectly agree with you that, especially those who are for kind of, in this case, unionist, or anyway, someone pushing on, on a very identity issue. Border, you need borders, you need enemies, etc. For example, talking about this side, I, I was always surprised that even here in Italy, the Northern League, they had their regional section. So you had the Northern League Kingdoms, the Northern League Lombardy, etc. And possibly they would like to have even smaller units because they need to, I mean, they are identified by borders and if the border is not there, you are lost. Yeah, and what are borders, you know? <laughs> I'm David Elwood, I, uh, I'm expat, Anglo-Scottish, Anglo we've been teaching in Italy for many, many decades, international politics, international history, I've lived all, through all this without having any vote either in Britain or in Italy, we'll leave that for, for now. Uh, for me, what you've just said is a confirmation of my theory about Brexit, which was a triumph of militant provincialism. Uh, I think George, populism uh, the whole debate about populism is lacking a geographical dimension. It comes in different flavors, in different expressions, wherever you are. Uh, and the Northern League in Italy is extraordinary because it's one populist movement which comes out of a very prosperous area. As you said, and you, most of these populisms come from, uh, come from very poor, marginal areas. And on that subject, I'd like to ask you about the fact that, that Ireland, the Republic of Ireland, is so much more prosperous than Northern Ireland. In fact, Northern Ireland, for everything you read, is going from bad to worse. No, the Republic of Ireland is now enjoying the benefits, presumably, I would like to hear you on this, of the EU Next Generation Recovery Plan. Something we talk about a great deal in Italy, because Italy has had more money than anybody else. What's happening to it? That's another story. But I'd like to know the fact that there is this tremendous economic distance and difference between the condition of the Republic and the condition of Northern Ireland, how does that affect politics in Northern Ireland and their attitude to Europe? First, on, on the populism, uh, that is a key part of Brexit in terms of the individuals and uh, the populist message. For those of you, and I should have maybe added this as a slide as well, in terms of there was a big red bus. Um, and it, it, ha it was a wonderful, wonderful uh, ploy. It had the bottom take control back. It had, which, it used to be just, it, I'll talk about talk about the individual later, but take back control. It had, you pay so much to the EU, which was the overall amount of money the UK paid to the EU, which was true, but it didn't include, the UK had a rebate. It didn't inc include the fact that the UK also got money from other policy areas. But, um, and had, rather than giving the money to the EU, give it to the National Health Service. Everyone in the UK, most people love the National Health Service, but it was a wonderful gimmick. And people, so we don't give it to the EU, we actually uh, give it to the uh, European, we give it to that National Health Service, uh, in terms of a motivating factor. And I know nurses, and spoken to them, we said, we thought it was true until we voted to leave, and then we realised there was much more to it than that, and that money doesn't transfer it automatically. But leave that aside. In terms of North and South, yeah, Northern Ireland is not doing anywhere near as well as the Republic of Ireland. The Republic of Ireland, having had a austerity in not that long ago uh, phase, now finds itself in the very fortunate position of getting taxes from multinationals who have set up in, in Dublin substantial amounts. So it's now sitting on a huge surplus. I can't remember the actual figures offhand, but it's sitting on a huge, or about to sit on a huge, there, yes, there's that lovely bus. Um, Made in Germany. A week. Yeah, yeah, yes. A week. <laughs> yes. And a few, yeah, yeah. There are more than one of them, obviously. Um, but yeah, as a gimmick, that works. What works so well. In fact, this, you know, and the other thing to put in all, again, I'll come back to the question. Uh, the other thing to bear in mind that I haven't discussed, because it's another whole issue, it was how does the media respond to that? That is factually incorrect when you break it down. Uh, the person who actually created it was a guy called Dominic Cummings, who hated the European Union, and he was asked, him, but that figure's not right. And he said, I know that figure's not right. It doesn't matter that I know that. The people will buy this, that that figure actually is right. So, and the BBC got itself into all sorts of, you know, what is impartiality? Um, 
kick on herself into all sorts of difficult scrapes about presenting this, but then not attacking in terms of act or pointing out this actually is incorrect. I mean, that's another issue of the media, how they play into all of this. Certainly crucial for the Brexit vote uh, when you break down. Yeah, I don't get into too much the Brexit vote, but when you break down who voted for Brexit, it becomes, you see a very different pattern begin to emerge. We're back again to those um, more poorly off, uh, wageless. In fact, two th million people voted, came out of nowhere. They never normally voted in their life, but they came out to vote for, for, for this. But leaving that aside, back to uh, Northern Ireland and the Republic. The Republic is suddenly finding itself with a huge uh, amount of money to spend. Uh, it hasn't worked out how it's going to spend that yet, but there are, um, yeah, the Northern Ireland is looking and it would like some help in various infrastructure projects which look as if they may actually come in, in Northern Ireland. Northern Ireland isn't doing particularly, it's doing better than the 70s and 80s and 90s. There is more uh, inward investment, particularly from the US, particularly in the computing and uh, biotechnology sectors, but it's still very small. It's, there's much more that, 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 that needs to be done to bring it up to a par with uh, the Republic. And for someone, I'll express my age again, as someone who was older, and I can remember when you used to cross the border between Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland, you noticed the difference immediately because the roads started to get worse and potholes. That's all long gone. That's history. It's now the other way around. Uh, how do they see in terms of the European Union? Ireland, uh, the big change there has been Sinn Féin, who look as if and opinion polls, but it, it, it's, it, it's, things can go wrong, but if most opinion polls, most commentators believe that Sinn Féin will be the next largest party in the next upcoming Irish elections. Um, they traditionally were very much Eurosceptic, but they are moving. They, they know, use, uh, you will know the GUI group, uh, the left group in the European Parliament. Sinn Féin are now in conversation to leave the GUI group and actually join the Socialist group. So that's a big move from them. So they've moved from staunch Eurosceptics in the 80s to softer Eurosceptics, how we're going to define it, to more pragmatic Eurosceptics today. So it's with a, a leaning towards, ah, we don't really know, we like this thing, but we can see the advantages. And actually, um, one of the things that Sinn Féin is doing, it, because it has the MEPs in Brussels, it has a monthly, you may have seen this, a monthly newsletter which makes its case for Irish unification. It is going round uh, various, as it can do, other delegations actually um, making the case, telling them why it should happen. Their monthly newsletter, by the way, is not, it's in Irish, it's in English, and it's in three other European languages. And it's not the biggest ones, you might think, in terms of the language. So it's trying to get that message across. So for the moment, it sees the European Union as actually a, so it's really changed. The other parties in the Republic, apart from the more, even the more left-leaning, really left-leaning, um, religious uh, right, left-leaning, but on very strong conservative views, but then the minority are one of the more Eurosceptic uh, today. Um, but Sinn Féin traditionally was the, the Eurosceptic, the others are all sort of a pro-European a pro Union. In the North, the issue Sinn Féin will have is, will it carry out, so look out for when it holds its election um, and campaign. In government, it could be a scenario, it's a government in the South. It's also if devolution comes back, and I think it is coming back, because I think the DUP can't hold out much longer. It's coming back. They could also be in power in the north of Ireland. And then, then look, because they may quite often run on different policy platforms. Anyway, that's probably too much detail but uh, to watch that one. On the north, the parties, oh, all oh, Sinn Féin, pro-EU, more, uh, a much stronger, there's an alliance grouping, which is essentially, it's the middle classes tend to be voting for that group, are pro-EU. The Unionist Party, the DUP, is staunchly anti-EU, even though they had an MEP for years, he never, actually several MEPs for years, he never ever explained what the EU was, and uh, never seemed to uh, learn or listen, to, never sit with any of the other groups. And the other Unionist groups, 
well, there's one that's very much staunch, but it's small. Uh, and the other major unionist one is on the fence. Yeah, run between pro and anti, so. That was a long quote, but no, no, just too much information that you needed to, to know. But basically, say, the Republic is very keen, and you see opinion polls, the, Repub the citizens of the Republic of Ireland heavily thinking of the European Union as a positive thing. There's a question there? Well, the microphone go goes there. I feel that one of the possible uh, variables would be, as you were saying, this idea of orbiting or deorbiting the EU. Because, in a way, even for the parties that they have to, to choose, if to remain loyalist, etc., the point is that if you stay with Britain, then there is a, a part of the economic issue that is not in their favour. If they are, if they become, as you said, moderate sceptics, maybe that they say, well, but the EU is offering a kind of large market, better benefits for us, etc. So it will be a an hard negotiation in a way or in another. Or maybe, you know, they may, they may still find that hard to reconcile with, but what they might see is, putting it another way, is they might see the Irish government actually willing to... There are major infrastructure projects that have fallen behind because Northern Ireland is broke at the moment, yeah. so it needs money, and therefore if the good old Irish Republic stepped in is we could start building some of these bridges. But bridges aren't the main thing, it's roads. Roads and ailing hospitals are the main and yeah, educational buildings that need to be I mean Northern Ireland essentially no devolution, it's a mess economically in terms of it needs it urgently needs money. Yeah. It's working, it's working, working. Okay. Thank you for your uh, lecture, first of all, was really interesting. And what I wanted to ask is, uh, from what I know, uh, the UK Parliament needs to approve any uh, referendum outcome for Scottish or Northern Highland independence. Do you think that this is a, it could actually happen or just nonsense? It will not happen. Yeah. It's not going to happen anytime soon. If you go back to David, there was that first. There been 179, ignore that for now. There was a referendum in 2014 about Scottish independence, the one I mentioned very, very briefly. Uh, they, those supporting independence lost. They took Glasgow, Glasgow is the biggest city by far, uh, much bigger than Edinburgh. They voted overwhelmingly to leave the, the UK, but the rest of Scotland actually wasn't of the same position. But David Cameron only agreed to that, who was then Prime Minister, only agreed to that referendum because he said, I can't not agree it because in the, bear with me here, in the Scottish Parliament elections, the SNP, the Scottish Nationals Party, won 56 out of 59 seats. And he said, there's no way, I can't say no, they won 56, I had no one, the system wasn't set up for that to actually happen. I said, I've got to agree to it, so we agree to it. Um, but they're not going to agree to it. I mean, uh, they're quite clear earlier this year and last year, we are, that's the UK government saying it, Westminster has to actually agree. It was taken to the courts. Courts, of course, is UK Parliament is sovereign. It therefore has to agree before a referendum is called. So unless the Scottish Nationals can actually find enough support in the UK Parliament, they're, they're in difficulty. Labour doesn't like it, Labour sees its, its comeback is in Scotland and it's looking for 20, 30, 40 seats to grab at the next election. They're not going to vote for it, Conservatives are definitely not going to vote for it, and the Lib Dems, smaller third party, they're not going to vote for it either. So, and I think the support for Scottish unification is on the decline, but people might take me up on that. But I think the change of, we mentioned Nicola Sturgeon, the former leader, she was very media savvy. She was great at sound bites. She was great at schmoozing an audience. Her successor isn't. And I think that will, that will matter. So yes, I don't think it's going to happen anytime soon. And then especially because the court ruled that a second referendum would be a problem because they already had one on the very same issue. The point was, if you remember, Part of the campaign or counter campaign was if you leave the UK, you will leave EU. <laughs> now we say, but we, we stay with the UK because we want to be in the EU. <laughs> that was an issue for those who voted for Brexit, saying in Scotland, 
we want them to remain in the UK, but we actually want to remain in the UK for the UK to remain in the EU. Now you've left the EU, we want another vote. And that's what that sort of rose, the opinion polls, towards the 2017, 18, 19, uh, even to 20, but it's recently begun to fall away again. Uh, it could come back, uh, but if it does come back, it needs, still needs to start. The UK government, the UK Parliament actually voted actually. The UK Prime Minister say yes, and then support in, in Parliament. Other questions? It's too many two hours. Yeah. You are very close to the to the end, but uh, no, no, sure. no, just I mean, look, keep looking at the UK and keep seeing whether you because the other interesting thing about opinion polls, as you will all know, is that we have a number of they're on the left, but also the right populist parties who claimed that they wanted to leave the European Union. Now most of them, not all of them, the AFD and Germany's gone a different way, but most of them now have softened their rhetoric. They're still anti-EU, but actually we'll change the EU from within. You know, they all, you've heard that many times before. And a large part of that comes from, you know, as seeing what happened with Brexit. Because at the end of the day, Brexit was not expected. Brexit, as they tried to work it out, was a mess. For those who advocated for Brexit, they've got to make it a success. They're doing everything they can to say, it's working, it's working, it's working. But as we move further from that, and maybe we'll, we'll probably get a 2026, we have a 10-year review, where have we got to? Then I think you're going to get really hard questions to be asked. But I think other European nations are seeing what's happened with the UK and realising, yeah, it's probably better to be in the thing, taking decisions with them, than being outside, and if I'm right about orbiting, being outside and having no say at all in the shaping of that policy. So watch the UK carefully. Just one very quick, uh, quick question uh, about Sinn Féin. Is it true, especially given your... Uh, very quick question about Sinn Féin, especially given that in light of what you said about how they're shooting, is it true that that is gaining for ourselves alone? Is it? Is it it's true that that's the oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. ourselves yeah. alone? Yeah. So that's particularly what you say is very ironic. Yes. Um, but yeah, I think they say <laughs> they're pragmatic enough to see. Yeah, they they need to work with others. Um, they, if you don't mind, first I have to say we are a bit disappointed because we didn't hear such a proper modern. Island accent, but we will forgive you for this. <laughs> if I did, you might have had difficult, real difficult things. Yeah. Do you mind that, because since we share this, let's say, culture of the ground, that was, it was fiction, it was comedy, but sometimes my favorite joke is, is it Hollywood inventing America or is America inventing Hollywood? In this case, we could say, is the beeps inventing the UK or vice versa. This is quite odd, but listen what the authors were saying about the UK and the EU. The writing's on the wall. Well, in any event, we have to think of something to make the public think kindly towards administration because of the Europass. I'm glad. You know Europass? You know Europass? European identity card. Well, Bernard, surely you've informed the minister. Well, minister, didn't you do your boxes last night? No, I was redrafting the redraft of the draft. <laughs> But well, briefly, Minister, Brussels is about to decree that there should be a new European identity card to be carried by all citizens of the EEC. Now, the Foreign Office is quite ready to go along with it as a quid pro quo for a deal over the Butter Mountain, the Wine Lake, and the Milk Ocean. <laughs> the Lamb War and the Cod Stick. <laughs> and quite obviously, the Prime Minister wants you to introduce the legislation. Me? Yes, well, it's well known that you're pro-Europe, you see. And it would simplify our administration enormously in the long run, so it's a good idea. Good, good idea. idea. Good idea. Good idea. <laughs> Not a good idea. Political suicide. Trying to make British people carry and pass the identification papers. They also have introducing a police state again. Is this what we fought two world wars for, Humphrey? Well, Minister, it's really little more than a sort of driving license. It's the last nail in my coffin, that's what it is. So you might get away with calling it Euro Club Express. <laughs> 
to introduce it. How the Foreign Office do it? Well, in fact, that was the Prime Minister's original suggestion, but the Foreign Secretary thought that this was a Home Office matter, and the Home Office took the view that it was essentially an administrative matter, and the Prime Minister agreed. They're all playing past the parcel. Can you blame them when you can hear it ticking? <laughs> Well, I'm afraid that the identity card bill is planned to be the last action of this department. One of my ammunition for the anti-Europeans. Let the Foreign Office realize what damage this will do to the European idea. Well, I'm sure they do. That's why they support it. Well, sure, the Foreign Office is pro-Europe, isn't it? Yes and no. <laughs> if you'll forgive the expression. The Foreign Office is pro-Europe because it is really anti-Europe. The civil service was united in its desire to make sure that the common market didn't work. That's why we went into it. What are you talking about? <laughs> yes, sir. Britain has had the same foreign policy objective for at least the last 500 years. To create a disunited Europe. In that cause, we have fought with the Dutch against the Spanish, with the Germans against the French, with the French and Italians against the Germans, and with the French against the Germans and Italians. Divide and rule, you see. Why should we change now, when it's worked so well? That's all. <laughs> surely. Yes, and current policy. We had to break the whole thing up, so we had to get inside. We tried to break it up from the outside, but that wouldn't work. Now that we're inside, we can make a complete pig's breakfast of the whole thing. <laughs> Except the Germans against the French, the French against the Italians, the Italians against the Dutch. The Foreign Office is terribly pleased. It's just like old times. <laughs> Surely you're all committed to the European ideal. Really, Minister? <laughs> Not. Why are we pressing for an increase in the membership? Well, for the same reason. It's just like the United Nations, in fact. The more members it has, the more arguments it can stir up, the more futile and impotent it becomes. Appalling cynicism. Appalling <laughs> cynicism. And as I said, Brexit was not attended as a result, but it was appealed cynicism. Uh, a last word to you, Lee, since you were. Yeah, no, not so many clips like that. Again, UK now out. Um, yeah, I mean, it, it's, it's, it, it's funny watching those clips in terms of. Whether you, you know, they're, they're tongue in cheek, but actually, my final word to say is that the UK actually, once it was in, yeah, there were tricky issues fishing, agriculture, but actually, really important things to the UK, like the whole idea who drove the single market, who drove competition, and their own vision, it was the UK. So, the history of the UK, of the UK and the EU, I think, will be largely positive, um, which is why, as I said at the very beginning, the UK Parliament, the UK Government all wanted to remain in the European Union, but events, some of their own making, uh, overtook them, and we are where we are. A lesson for all, I think. Thank you so much, Steve.